a question is why do we want to manipulate graphene at the atomic scale? Why do we care? Graphene is a multipotent uh, uh, material. It has a lot of different opportunities. So in the future, you can uh, imagine graphene being produced roughly the same way as a newsprint is produced today, uh, with uh, very large machines that produce seven meter wide uh, material at 200 kilometers an hour. And uh, it will certainly have uh, major impact, impacts. Uh, think, for instance, about uh, lightweight composite materials, because graphene is one to three hundred times stronger than the uh, strongest steel. Uh, so uh, in uh, airplanes, in cars, uh, you can reduce the weight, you can improve uh, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, new kinds of uh, uh, medical uh, implants, uh, there are uh, plans for, uh, for instance, retina implants. Uh, there are techniques now that uh, are being developed to use uh, graphene membranes uh, to uh, desalinate uh, uh, seawater. Uh, to make it portable. So it, uh, it's a technology that has very wide application area. So it will certainly penetrate the life of Europeans on many levels. And because of these great opportunities, we see that there is also great potential for new products, uh, new investment opportunities, new uh, job opportunities, and increased economic growth in, in Europe. And the idea is that what we would like to eventually do, I think what a lot of people in this room would like to do, and some of us are already starting to do it, is to carve graphene up, to cut it up into little quantum mechanical, little structures that are designed at the quantum mechanical level to s perform certain functions. And we would like to be able to functionalize the graphene with atoms and molecules and control the edges and then wire it up with metals so that we could create an integrated device on a single layer of graphene so that we could have a better video game for our children. And so this is, this is something that a lot of people are working towards, and uh, Faden Avoris, I think, showed some nice progress in this direction. But there's still a lot of work that we need to do in order to achieve this, this kind of a, of, of a dream. Uh, and uh, part of that work involves uh, better understanding how graphene behaves at microscopic length scales, at the atomic length scale. In other words, what happens uh, around individual atoms, what happens at edges, and what happens when you strain graphene at very small length scales. We can see great applications in uh, flexible electronics. Uh, electronic paper is uh, one of the first things coming out. New kinds of composite materials, ubiquitous electronics. You can uh, have electronics in your uh, clothing, for instance, or integrated in wallpaper or in uh, many other ways. theory had shown that graphene wasn't possible to exist in nature, it wasn't stable, then many people didn't think to look for it as a true two-dimensional material. And uh, Andre Geim and Kostja decided that this was not necessarily true and so they went looking for it. And the way that they went looking for it was using, as you've probably heard of the scotch tape method, which involves sellotape and a piece of, not pencil, but of high purity graphite. How do we go from this layered material to getting a single layer? A layer that's only one atom thick, um, a layer of graphene. It's actually surprisingly simple. You need to use a simple piece of sticky tape and we use, this, we use the tape to pull the layers of graphite apart. And every time we pull the tape apart, we break our graphite up. We're cleaving it, pulling apart the layers. So the pieces of graphite we had in here originally would have contained many thousands of layers. And if we do this enough times, we can hopefully end up with some layers that are only one or two atoms thick. One of the things that really helped us to understand that you really did have graphene was the types of very exciting new microscopes that are now available and was the availability of these microscopes that really helped them understand that what they actually had was a single atomic layer. Once you've worked with graphene for a while you get very used to looking at it and it's very easy for me to say that that is monolayer graphene while this here is probably two layers and these bits here are really quite thick. My name is Rahul Arnair. My name area of research is graphene-based membrane. So graphene oxide is super permeable to water, which means there is no resistance or barrier for water molecule to evaporate through graphene oxide. So this is how we produce our uh, graphene oxide membrane for our laboratory experiments. So we use this kind of porous support material to deposit uh, graphene oxide sheet to make a uh, freestanding membrane. So you use porous support there, then you pour graphene oxide solution over here, 
so this is a graphene oxide solution in water it has single layer graphene oxide dispersed uh, in pure water then you use this water on top of this porous alumina membrane then you uh, you start pumping using a vacuum pump then you remove all liquid water through this al alumina membrane and your graphene oxide sheet get deposited on top of this alumina and finally after drying you can peel it off this freestanding graphene oxide and uh, you can study membrane property or you can also characterize this membrane using some different technique. Graphene oxide uh, was shown by uh, Rahul in the physics department here to have high permeability to water but to be an effective barrier to all kinds of other things. One of the ideas is to use graphene as a type of nano membrane or filter and that harnesses the fact that graphene is very impermeable. It's, uh, even very light gases don't pass through and that means that if we were able to tailor the size of the pores within the graphene lattice it might be possible to produce a very selective filter or perhaps use smaller graphene sheets and use the pathways in between the sheets in order to tailor the porosity or the permeability of the membrane. 40 years ago or so desalination used to be based mainly on thermal methods whereby you would use high temperatures to separate um, clean water from the, the sea water uh, and, and extract it that way. That was high energy, it was high cost and some plants in the Gulf still use that method I believe but it's not currently what's used now. So now there's been a growing trend towards, over the last 40 years, a growing trend towards use of reverse osmosis and membrane technology in provision of desalinated water whereby you move the seawater across a semi-permeable membrane and you have the uh, desalinated water on the other side of the membrane. And this can be a world of difference to what happens on a small scale in the lab and what happens when you have football fields worth of membrane area on a real plant. So there are many challenges to actually getting a new membrane material accepted and used commercially on an industrial scale. And so those are the kinds of questions that I'm going to talk about today in this talk. Uh, so, um, so here they are, impurity, strain, and cutting graphene into little nano ribbon shapes. That's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, but before I get to that, I'll, I'll, I'll say some introductory words uh, talking about um, the techniques that we're, we've been using to do this work. Uh, which is mainly scanning tunneling microscopy. So I'll give you, I'll say a few introductory words about that technique. Uh, and then I'll, I'll say a little bit of also introductory words about the technique of STM spectroscopy, which uh, is a technique that we have found to be very useful for exploring these kinds of issues in, in graphene. Uh, so, uh, so first, let's just start with uh, discussing uh, scanning tunneling microscopy as, as a technique for exploring small structures. Uh, uh, a scanning tunneling microscope is a sharp metal needle which uh, we bring very close to a surface. We put a voltage between the needle and the surface and we measure the tunnel current and the rate at which these electrons tunnel from the tip to the surface is proportional to the lo electronic local density of states of, of the structure beneath the tip. Right, v Faden? <laughs> and uh, you remember giving these talks? <laughs> And, um, and this is a very useful quantity to measure because the electronic local density of states gives you a measure of the probability of finding an electron at a, a certain point in space at a certain point in, in energy. So if you can map that quantity out, you can learn a lot about what the electrons are doing in small structures. Uh, also, by varying this uh, voltage and measuring the differential conductivity of this STM tunnel junction, you can measure what we uh, refer to as DIDV. And by measuring that as a function of uh, the voltage between the tip and the sample, we can measure the energy dependence of the local density of states beneath the STM tip. And that's what this little cartoon is meant to show. And here, V equals zero is the Fermi level. And these are filled states. And these are empty states. Also, uh, the STM allows us to measure inelastic excitations of small structures. And the way we do that is if we put a bias on the STM tip that's big enough so that electrons tunneling from the tip to the surface have enough energy to create an inelastic excitation, then that gives those electrons an additional channel to go from the tip to the surface, an inelastic channel, 
uh, uh, say, by making a phonon, for example. And that then gives us a jump. See this little step right here? That gives us a jump in the DIDV at the, uh, at the uh, threshold energy for creating those excitations. So this technique has been used a lot over the years <clears throat> to study uh, graphene uh, in, in different forms. In fact, people were using STM to study graphene back in 1992, <laughs> although they didn't call it graphene back then, and it was not isolated uh, the way Gaim and Novoselov have since isolated it. Uh, this is graph people used to study graphene on metal surfaces a long time ago. Uh, more recently, people have been studying graphene with STM on other substrates, such as silicon carbide, silicon oxide, and more recently, uh, boron nitride, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. This is data from the Georgia Tech group, the Columbia group, and this is some data from my own group. And there's a lot of groups around the world that have been using STM to look at graphene, and here I've just listed some of the people uh, who are doing nice work with STM, but there are others too. I'm sorry if your name is not on there. Um, so uh, in my own group, we're very interested in using STM to perform local spectroscopy on graphene. And so a few years ago, we set out to perform uh, STM spectroscopy on gated graphene devices, such as the one that you see here. This is a photograph of a little device we made with Alex Zettel's help. Uh, this is a graphene flake, and we can gate it from the back and perform uh, STM spectroscopy. And what we expected to see when we did this experiment a few years ago is we expected to see uh, uh, a V in, in the local density of states, in, in the DIDV, because the local density of states of a material often mimics the total density of states, which is linear for graphene. And so and there's the Dirac point. And so that's what we expected to see. But when we did the experiment, that's not what we saw. <clears throat> in fact, we saw something that looked kind of different. Uh, here I show you the data, uh, what we actually saw. This is a plot of DIDV versus bias voltage between the tip and the surface. Uh, this is uh, the Fermi level. And, and here we have filled states and empty states. And each of these curves is measured at a different gate voltage. And we're becoming more and more p-doped as we go up each additional curve. And so the density of states is sort of shifting to the right uh, as you go up those curves due to the gating. Uh, and, and, and here we saw, some, we saw two features. One was this gap-like feature that's pinned to the Fermi level. Uh, and the other is this asymmetric dip off to one side. Now this, this gap-like feature. Uh, is pinned to the Fermi level for different gate voltages. So, so, we, so that tells us that it's not a, a, a band structure feature of graphene. It's some kind of excitation. And what we believe is happening is that this is a sign of, uh, it's not a true gap, but it's a sign of inelastic tunneling, phonon-assisted inelastic tunneling. And the idea is that when we, when, we get a, when we come to a bias here at about 65 volts, then the electrons have enough, the tunneling electrons have enough energy to create a phonon, uh, an out-of-plane phonon in the graphene, and so that creation of that phonon helps to get the electrons in. So we get a big jump in the current due to this inelastic tunneling channel. Here, this little dip, uh, that feature moves with gate voltage, so that tells us that it's a band structure feature, and in fact, that, that is actually uh, due to the Dirac point. So you can see the Dirac point moving, as you would expect, as you p-dope the material. So this is, so I just wanted to show you this and drag you through this because this is sort of the, the baseline STM uh, uh, spectroscopy of graphene. And this is what we see after doing some elaborate uh, tip calibration procedures. But what we're really interested in is uh, what happens when you modify graphene and what are the local properties of the graphene when you change it, when you manipulate its properties. Uh, and, and one of the ways of, of doing that is to drop atoms and molecules on the graphene or to have uh, impurities in the graphene. And I just want to point out that we already, have, we already know something about how graphene behaves when we, uh, when we uh, uh, add adsorbates to it from previous measurements. For example, this is Amir Jacobi's uh, measurement uh, using scanning uh, SCT, and you can see the electron hole puddles that uh, arise due to uh, impurities in the, uh, the, uh, derived from the silicon oxide layer. Also, from transport, you can also get some idea of what happens when you drop charge impurities onto graphene. And this is some work from Michael Fuhrer's laboratory. Um, but these measurements actually don't, uh, even though they, they give us a lot of good information, they don't tell us what's happening locally in the vicinity of these individual uh, uh, atomic size impurities. And so that's something that we're really 
interested in studying, and one of the reasons we're interested in it is because uh, if you have a charged impurity in graphene, then it's been predicted that uh, the electrons in graphene will, will behave uh, around that impurity uh, in differently than they behave in other materials. Uh, for example, if you consider impurities in silicon and gallium arsenide, you expect a different kind of uh, behavior for the electrons around an impurity in graphene because the electrons in graphene behave as massless Dirac fermions. And so uh, it's been predicted by people such as Levitoff and, and others as well uh, that uh, if you look at how these relativistic electrons behave around a Coulomb impurity, then there are different physical regimes depending on the strength of the Coulomb impurity. And you can get what is referred to as subcritical behavior where there are no bound states, no resonances, or, or, uh, or a critical regime where there are bound states that have a, a, a particular um, a narrow energy width and, and spatial distribution. So this is the kind of thing that we would like to uh, measure experimentally and to better understand. And so motivated by this, we dropped uh, atoms down onto graphene. Uh, we dropped different atoms. Uh, and uh, and what, one of the first atoms that we looked at is uh, cobalt. And so we dropped, we evaporated cobalt atoms down onto a gated graphene device um, at low temperature so that the atoms would stick and would not move all around. And then we took uh, STM images of it. And so here you see an STM image of a gated graphene device on silicon oxide where you can see two cobalt atoms. There they are. Uh, and what we did was we put our STM tip on top of those cobalt atoms so that we could measure their electronic structure. And so here I show you that electronic structure. So this is the electronic structure of a single cobalt atom sitting on top of a gated graphene device. This is DIDV as a function of uh, sample bias. Here's zero, that's the Fermi energy. And e each of these curves is, we're, we're p-doping the sample, so we're increasingly p-doping it as we go up. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of features there. There's a lot of resonances there. That, this is all due to the electronic structure of that atom just sitting on cobalt. Um, and so um, there's, it looks kind of complicated, but it's not so bad. Uh, there's really three main features. Uh, 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 this, th this first feature here at the center, at zero, there's this dip at the Fermi level which uh, is gate independent. And, and we believe that that dip is simply an inelastic feature due to the vibrations of the cobalt atom. So I don't want to focus on that in this talk, unless you force me to. <laughs> but uh, what I'd rather focus on is these, uh, 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 these other features, these, uh, these features with, which change with the gate voltage. Uh, and so in order to, to understand those better, I've plotted the energy of all these resonances here this is the energy versus gate voltage. And I've also plotted the Dirac point, how it moves with uh, gate voltage. So you can see that some of these features move with the Dirac point and other features don't. They move opposite in energy of the Dirac point. Now these features that move in red that I've outlined in red, these ones that move with the Dirac point, because they move with the Dirac point, that implies that they are density of states features. They're, they're, they're features embedded in the band structure due to that impurity. and so. The idea, uh, which you can see in this little cartoon, is that the cobalt atom, uh, if you take the cobalt atom, an isolated atom, it has atomic energy levels. And so if you take that atom and you stick it, on, you drop it onto a piece of graphene, then those atomic energy levels are going to hybridize in some way with the graphene, and that's going to lead to defect uh, states, which I have drawn schematically here. So this is not the result of a calculation. This is just a cartoon. Uh, and so here, here are, are defects, defect states and the density of states of graphene. Now, <clears throat> we can see those defect states with the STM in our spectroscopy. And something that's kind of nice, uh, something that's kind of new, I think, is that we can change the energy level of those defect states with the back gate. So we can gate, gate our atom, we can gate the surface, and we can move those defect states up and down in energy. And the reason that's significant is because that, if we put, that allows us to fill or deplete those, those defect states with charge. So here, for example, uh, I'm showing you uh, a scenario where we've gated the, the sample at a, ga at a gate such that these defect states are below the Fermi energy. And I have uh, a negative sign there to indicate that they're filled with charge negative charge because they're below the Fermi energy. And here you can see the actual data. This is the DIDV versus voltage, and th these are the impurity states below the Fermi energy. 
Now here, I'm showing you the, uh, 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 the same atom, but, but with a different gate voltage. So now those states have been pushed above the Fermi energy. And I put a little plus sign there because now the charge has flowed out of those states. So now we've depleted, we've, we've removed charge from, the def from that uh, uh, cobalt defect. And here you can see that in the data. Here are those same states, but now pushed above the Fermi energy here. Now, you might also have noticed these other little uh, uh, states right here, right, that I've marked with the S, that those, those states are due to tip-induced charging of the defect. And uh, the, a, a nice way to think about it is uh, we have an atom sitting on the surface. We gate the sample, and that, can, that determines a charge state for the atom. But then we can bring the tip in, and the tip is also a gate. It's a movable gate. It's another gate. And we can bring that tip in, and then we can use the tip to change the, the, the charge on the, on the atom. For example, we can either, uh, for example, here, uh, in, in this case, I have electrons in the defect state, but I can, at this bias voltage, the, the STM tip is sucking the, the electrons out of the atom, and that's why we get this little bump. Whereas in this case, where I've, I've already removed the charge from the atom with the gate, at this bias voltage, the STM tip is pushing electrons into the uh, atom. And so that's why we get a, uh, this little bump. So, uh, so this is kind of a nice new capability that we have, which is to control uh, the charge state of this defect using the back gate. Uh, and, and one of the things that we would like to do with this new capability is to uh, use it to investigate how Coulomb, in, how, uh, um, what happens in the vicinity of Coulomb potentials on graphene. Uh, because now we can change the charge state, and what we would like to do is then measure around these charge impurities what the electrons are doing in the graphene. So that's something that we want to do. But we have problems. Nothing is ever perfect. And, what, and the problems that we've been having, because we've been trying to do this, one of the problems that we have is that the graphene is so inhomogeneous. These, this is a, an STM image of the electron hole puddles in graphene that you've already heard about. Uh, and this electronic inhomogeneity in graphene makes these kinds of measurements hard for us because it obscures what's happening. Because if I put one atom down, say I put an atom right there, then if there's some uh, uh, charge distribution around that atom due to the Coulomb impurity, it gets obscured by all of this uh, charge inhomogeneity. Another issue that we have is that <clears throat> the co the, uh, this is a problem we have with cobalt atoms, is that the impurity itself uh, has, uh, has what we call, a, 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 I might call it, say, an, uh, an inhomogeneous charge state. And what I mean by that is that we can set the charge state of the atom with the back gate, but then it, uh, but, and then we want to map what the electrons are doing around it in the graphene. But the problem we have is that sometimes the STM tip will cause the charge state of the atom to, to switch. I mentioned that to you earlier. And so we have trouble then mapping what's happening around the impurity because sometimes the impurity's charge will switch. And, that, and you can see that here by this ring. This is a phenomenon that people have seen in other STM experiments as well. This is what we sometimes refer to as an ionization radius. And what it means is that when the STM tip is outside of this radius, the, the, the atom is in one charge state. But when we go inside of the radius, it switches to another charge state. And that's due to the fact that the tip is a movable gate. So these are problems for us. Um, uh, although, you know, maybe sometimes we try to pretend that it's all really great, but actually it's not. Uh, but we have made progress at solving these problems, so I want to tell you about some of the progress that we've made. And uh, we've made a lot of progress because uh, uh, mainly recently through the use of boron nitride as a substrate. So this is a really great thing, and, and the, the first people to do it was the Columbia Group. And, uh, and they showed that if you put graphene on boron nitride, then you can greatly enhance the mobility. Uh, and so th we were inspired by this great result to try this ourselves. And so we built some devices um, uh, uh, in this fashion. We put boron nitride flakes on silicon oxide, and we took CVD graphene and put it over. And then we stuck it into our scanning tunneling microscope. And these devices, uh, were, we, uh, Alex Zettel's group also helped us to fabricate these devices. And so we looked at those devices with, with uh, STM, and, uh, and, uh, and, and it turned out that they looked really great. And so this helped solve one of our problems, which is this inhomogeneity problem. Uh, because here you can see that graphene on boron nitride, 
uh, here, you can, here we compare graphene on boron nitride to graphene on silicon oxide. This is the topography, the comparison, and you can see that graphene on boron nitride is orders of magnitude more flat. And also down here, we compare the charge in, homo in homogeneity for graphene on boron nitride compared to graphene on silicon oxide. And you can just see uh, from the color scale that graphene on, on boron nitride is, is, much less, uh, is much more homogeneous. Uh, so that's really great for us. That solves one of our problems. I also want to point out that about the same time we were doing this work, uh, Brian Leroy's uh, group also did similar work in collaboration with the Columbia group, and they got results that are very similar to ours. Um, and so that's a great substrate to use, and so now we're using that substrate, graphene on boron nitride, and it allows us to solve another one of our problems because now that we have such a nice flat surface for the graphene to sit on, we can perform atomic manipulation uh, on the atoms that we put on the graphene, and we can actually engineer our own defects by moving the atoms together, and so we can create new defects that have different charging properties than the ones that we have before. Like, for example, before we were limited to, say, monomers, that, uh, uh, the, gra the cobalt monomers, but now we can take the cobalt monomers and move them together. You can see these three have been moved together like that. Then these two we move together with the STM tip to create a dimer. And then we can move this one over here to create a trimer. So now we can create these small clusters which have different charging properties. And that's, been, that's actually been good for us because when we look at this cobalt trimer, for example, uh, we find that they, these, uh, these clusters have m much nicer charging properties than the monomers. And, and they can, we can put them into stable charge states. Uh, here, for example, <clears throat> the cobalt trimer, we can, we can gate the cobalt trimer such that when we bring our STM tip and image the electrons around the trimer in, uh, in, different uh, in, in a particular charge state, the trimer stays in that charge state. So we, we, can, we can put the, uh, the, the trimer into different charge states, and then we can map out the electrons around it, and, uh, and the charge state will not change. And so that, that's, for us, that's progress. And so uh, this, is, this is a work in progress. We're not done, but we're very excited about this because now we're starting to map out what the electrons are doing uh, around these Coulomb impurities, and we can control the charge on these Coulomb impurities. So now we have a chance of actually testing some of these ideas. For example, here you can see an uncharged cobalt trimer. Here you can see a charged cobalt trimer, and this yellow halo, that's the electrons in graphene rearranging themselves around that charged trimer due to that Coulomb impurity. So the physics that we want to get at is living in that halo. So that's what we're, that's what we're in the process of analyzing now. So, uh, okay, so, so putting atoms down onto graphene is one way in which you can change the properties of graphene, but another way, uh, well, but you might want to change it in, in, in different ways. For example, you might want to induce an energy gap in the graphene. Uh, you might want to quantize the energy levels in graphene. And so uh, a way in which you can do that, if you, if you want to change it in that way, <clears throat> one, one, thing, one of the many things you can do is to turn on a magnetic field. And a magnetic field is nice because when you turn on a magnetic field, it causes the electrons to go around in circles. And uh, when you quantize that motion, that circular motion, then you get Landau levels. And the degeneracy and energy spacing between the Landau levels is going to depend on the strength of that magnetic field. So this kind of behavior has been seen a lot for graphene. And since I'm giving an STM talk, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about some of the nice STM data that, show, that shows these Landau levels. And some of the nicest data has been taken by uh, Eva Andres' group, as well as Joe Strosio's group in collaboration with Phil First. And they've seen beautiful Landau levels with, with their STM uh, up at magnetic fields around 5 Tesla. Um, but a question that I want to ask is, what happens if you, make a if you take a sheet of graphene and carve out a little tiny device, a little tiny submicron device, like here, like I've shown in blue, and what, what if you wanted to create Landau levels right there in that region, but did not want Landau levels here in these contact regions? How, how might you do that? Well, uh, uh, the answer, I think, for, for normal materials is that there's no way that you could do that because you can't shrink your superconducting magnet down to submicron dimensions. Superconducting magnets are about this big. You can't shrink them down that big. Uh, and so this would normally be impossible. But with graphene, this kind of, uh, this kind of experiment uh, 
uh, is a actually is sort of possible because graphene has a very peculiar property, which is that if you strain it uh, in a particular way, then, you, then the electrons in graphene will behave as though there's a magnetic field turned on. They're going to want to go around in circles. And that's a very kind of uh, peculiar effect. Uh, I don't know any other material that has this effect. Uh, and so I just want to spend a, a, a minute or two trying to give you a, a hand-waving explanation of why graphene has this really interesting behavior. Uh, uh, that when you strain it in a particular way, it behaves as though there's a magnetic field. And we call that a pseudo-magnetic field. Now, uh, the reason that this, it, that this occurs is because of a very intimate relationship that exists between strain in graphene and the electromagnetic vector, vector potential. And one way of looking at this is, uh, is to consider graphene, and now uh, this is unstrained graphene. Now consider graphene that has undergone some amount of strain. You stretch it, and what that does is it causes the atoms to change their relative distance between each other. That then causes the, uh, uh, the quantum mechanical hopping amplitude to change for an electron to hop from one carbon atom to the other. And what that does to the quantum mechanical eigenstates, the electronic eigenstates, shift then in reciprocal space like this, that little delta k, that's meant to represent the shift of the, eigen, of the graphene eigenstates in reciprocal space due to that strain. Now, if you remember some basic quantum mechanics, then you might remember that if a charged particle is moving through space and you turn on a magnetic field, then what that does is it changes the momentum of the particle by an amount that's proportional to the vector potential. So take a look at these two equations, and you can see that they're very similar. And so what we can do is we can, we can create a mapping between this change in momentum and, and this vector potential. And, uh, and if you're smart and you work through the details, as, as smart people have done, then you find that, uh, that for a particular strain, for a particular strain tensor in graphene, uh, you, that will lead to a pseudo vector potential uh, that I can, you can write down as I've done here in this formula. And you can see that the pseudo vector potential depends on the uniaxial strain or, or the normal strain components as well as the shear strain in, in this way. You can then take the curl of this, vec of this pseudo vector potential and that will create a pseudo magnetic field. And so the electrons will then feel that pseudo magnetic field which arises purely due to strain even in the absence of an actual magnetic field. So, uh, so a couple of years ago some smart people wrote a really clever paper, uh, and here they are. It was uh, Paco Guinea, Katznelson, and Andre Geim, <laughs> honorary theorist. <laughs> and so uh, this is a really nice paper where they came up with uh, this uh, clever idea of taking this mapping, and they figured out a particular um, strain geometry in which case the resulting mag pseudo magnetic field would lead to a constant magnetic field which would cause the electrons to go around in a circle leading to Landau levels, pseudo Landau levels. And what they figured out is that if, is that if you create a trigonal strain pattern, one that has triangular symmetry, then if you work through the details of this formula, then that should lead to a constant magnetic field. The question, though, and, and, and subsequently Landau levels. The question, of course, though, is how to test this idea. And in that paper, they actually suggested uh, an idea of using differential thermal contraction. And so that's what we did. Uh, and, and so we, we tested this idea by, uh, 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 by using differential thermal contraction. And the idea here is that if you put graphene on a substrate and then cool it down, Graphene does not shrink that much when you cool it down, whereas other materials will shrink more, and that can lead, that can lead to large, uh, a large buildup of strain in the graphene, which uh, could then uh, provide possibly highly strained regions which might show some of these effects. So that was actually an idea that they mentioned in their paper. And so we, we tried out this idea by um, uh, epitaxially growing graphene on platinum at high temperature. Uh, and then we cooled down the graphene and looked at it with our STM. And I just want to mention that other people ha ha have grown graphene on platinum long before us, and so we copied their recipes. For example, Combshell's group and Salmeron's group. So we just copied their recipes uh, and grew it, and then we looked at it at low temperature and we saw something kind of interesting. Um, this is what we saw. This is an STM image of graphene grown on platinum 111. This, this region right here is a patch of graphene. Uh, 
if you can see the outline of it. And these bubbles, which appear at nanometer length scale, we refer to as nanobubbles. And we saw these nanobubbles all over the place on, these gra on the graphing that we grew on platinum. And these nanobubbles are, have a, a, a triangular shape. They're like little pyramids with three sides, sort of tetrahedral. And what we saw, we, we then did spectroscopy on this surface. And when we did STM spectroscopy away from those nanobubbles, the spectroscopy was pretty featureless and, and, and pretty boring. But when we did spectroscopy right on top of the nanobubbles, we saw something very interesting. We saw these peaks in the local density of states appearing at different energies. So we saw these very pronounced peaks. And what we think these peaks are, we believe that these peaks are, are due to the Landau levels uh, occurring in these nanobubbles as a result of the pseudomagnetic field that is induced by the strain in these little strained nanobubbles. And <clears throat> in order to further test that idea, we looked at a lot of these nanobubbles. We performed spectroscopy on a lot of them. And we took all of the different peaks, and we plotted the distribution of peak energies, uh, as you see here. And we see that this peak distribution follows, uh, it, it, it follows the behavior that we would expect for uh, Landau levels in uh, graphene, a square root of n behavior. And so from, from this behavior, we can then extract a pseudomagnetic field. Uh, from, the from the spacing of, of these peaks. And when we extract that pseudomagnetic field, we get a field that's very high on the order of several hundred tesla. Here, for example, I show results from one particular nanobubble. Here's a picture of it. Uh, and here you can see the, the, um, the uh, pseudomagnetic field that we extracted from this nanobubble up here at around 400 tesla. Now, uh, in order to, to further test this interpretation, we performed, uh, uh, we, we, we did some theoretical calculations in collaboration with Paco Guinea and Castronero, uh, and that means that they did the calculations, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they used continuum elasticity theory, and they simulated nanobubbles having roughly the same size and strain as the ones that we saw experimentally. And this is the uh, pseudomagnetic field that they calculated, which is very comparable to the one that we saw experimentally. So, so this is further evidence to support this interpretation. Uh, and this is a, an, a, a result that I'm very excited about. And one of the reasons is because, this, because these pseudomagnetic fields are so high, several hundred tesla, it gives us, a, it gives us access to a new physical regime. For example, um, uh, 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 if you consider DC magnetic fields, the largest DC magnetic field that anyone has ever created in a laboratory is less than 100 tesla. But now we're looking at pseudomagnetic fields up at around 400 tesla. So this allows us to potentially explore a physical regime that's never, that could never be accessed by any other means. OK, so now what I've done is I've told you two ways in which we can modify the graphene, one by dropping atoms down onto it, and another by uh, straining it locally. Uh, and now I want to talk about uh, the third and final part of, of this talk, which is to explore what happens when you modify graphene by cutting it into little narrow strips that we refer to as nano ribbons. Now, uh, it turns out, and I think it's kind of obvious, that if you cut graphene into a little ribbon, you're going to get some size quantization. So you expect subbands and, and energy gaps to occur. And indeed, that happens. Uh, but there's also some other physics that occurs, which is, I think, not so obvious, which depends on the details of this edge. You can get some very interesting physics depending on, 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 on the symmetry of the edge. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, so, so let's talk about the edge. Um, if you take graphene and you cut a nano ribbon uh, out of it at, a, a, in this particular direction, then you'll get uh, edges that we call armchair edges. So here's the two sides of the nano ribbon. The nano ribbon extends in this direction. Uh, so if you cut, a, cut a, an armchair nano ribbon out of graphene, then you, it's been predicted, and uh, here are some theory papers <coughs> for various people who have made these predictions. It's been predicted that you will get an energy gap. Uh, and that energy gap should behave as um, 1 over the width 
And I think that makes intuitive sense because as you make the width narrower, you, it's like particle in a box. You make the box smaller, you expect the energy level spacing to get bigger. Uh, and so for the armchair nano ribbons, you can really think of this energy gap as a uh, size quantization effect. If you turn on electron-electron interactions, it doesn't change things all that much. So you, you just get that gap. And there's no edge state uh, for the armchair nano ribbons, or at least that's the prediction. On the other hand, uh, uh, if you take graphene and if you cut it at this other angle, 30 degrees from the armchair angle, right here at that angle, then you get uh, what is known as a zigzag nano ribbon, where these edges are zigzag edges. And, <clears throat> and the zigzag nano ribbons have been predicted to have very different behavior from the armchair nano ribbons. For example, in the absence of electron-electron interactions, it was predicted a while ago that you would get, uh, that you should get one-dimensional uh, metallic bands that are localized at the edge, edge states. And these, since these edge states are metallic, then uh, it was initially predicted that you should not even get uh, an energy gap for a zigzag nano ribbon. But then people thought about it some more, and they realized that if there's any, uh, if, if you include electron-electron interactions, then what happens, because this edge state has a big density of states at the Fermi energy, you, it's, it has been predicted that you would get a magnetic transition, that the edge would become ferromagnetic, and each ed it was predicted that each edge would become ferromagnetic and that there would be an anti-ferromagnetic correlation between the two edges. And this anti-ferromagnetic correlation has been predi was, is predicted to open up an energy gap. And that energy gap was predicted to vary as one over width. So, you, so here with the zigzag nano ribbon, you also are expected to get a one over width energy gap dependence, but for very different reasons, very different physics. And, and I, I just want to point out that some of these ideas have been thought about since, since the mid-90s, and Millie Dresselhaus is on some of these early papers. So some of these ideas are, are, are due in part to her. Uh, so the question then is how can we actually um, uh, uh, experimentally measure this kind of effect. It's kind of tricky to measure this kind of effect because to really uh, do it right, you need to do two things simultaneously. You need to measure the electronic structure of the nano ribbon while simultaneously measuring the uh, uh, geometric structure at the atomic length scale. Uh, you have to do both of those things. And so that's a, tall, that's a, that's a big challenge to do both of those things. But people uh, have been trying and have been investigating this system for a number of years. Here I show some, uh, some work a few years ago done by Philip Kim's group where they use transport measurements to look at the electronic properties of nano ribbons that they uh, define lithographically. Uh, and they were able to see some uh, uh, energy gap behavior. Uh, and other groups uh, did measurements as well on nano ribbons, such as Fade Navoris' group and others. Uh, so transport is a very nice way to measure electronic properties of, of nanostructures. But one of the problems is that it doesn't tell us what the local geometrical structure is. So it's hard to know what the edges are doing in these nano ribbons. For example, it's hard to know the level of disorder at the edges, whether it's armchair or, or zigzag. And so uh, because of that, that then motivates people like me and, and, and people like me who like to use microscopy. And so luckily, transport doesn't measure everything, so there's still some stuff for, for me to measure. Uh, and uh, other people uh, have been doing microscopy on these, uh, uh, these, uh, e these, these uh, graphene nanostructures for many years. Here is some early STM work. Uh, and one of the earliest things that people did was to look at the surface of graphite. Because if you can look at the step edge on the surface of graphite, that can give you some insight into the, elect the behavior of uh, graphene edges. And so that work was done uh, er early on. More recently, people have been looking at graphene nanoplatelets put on different materials. People have been doing TEM of graphene edges. And there's been some very beautiful recent work by Klaus Mullen's group making nanoribbons using molecular precursors that I think is really pretty cool. Um, and in my own group, one of the, our, our strategy, uh, this, what, what we decided to do was to look at nanoribbons that were made by unzipping nanotubes. And the idea, uh, the hope, was that by looking at nanoribbons made by unzipping nanotubes, the hope was that this would leave the edges pristine. Uh, and, 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 uh, and so that's what we wanted to do, was to look at nanoribbons with nice edges. And we, m my group, we don't do the unzipping. We don't, we don't unzip nanotubes. 
but there are other people who know how to do it. For example, one of the first groups to do it was Jim Tor, J James Tor's group. Uh, they developed a way uh, back in 2009 to unzip nanotubes to make nanoribbons. And more recently, <coughs> Hong Ji Dai's group has developed a new method for unzipping nanotubes that involves uh, sonicating the nanotubes in a, in a special kind of way. And so what I want to show you now is, is some results that we got looking at, at these nano ribbons. And here's the recipe for how to make them in this paper. So Hong Ji Dai gave us some of these nano ribbons and we spun coat them onto clean gold crystals and we looked at them with STM and this is what we saw. This is a, a room temperature STM image of a single nano ribbon uh, on gold and, I, and, and uh, it's a beautiful nano ribbon. <laughs> Believe me, we've looked at a lot of unbeautiful ones. Uh, this is, and, but, but using this technique, the nano ribbons are, are, are almost always really nice. So you can see that it has very nice straight edges. And when we take a, here's a cross-sectional slice at this little black slice right there is, is this cross-sectional slice. And you can see that at the, at the, near the edges, we see this curvature which we, we did not expect. It was kind of an unexpected feature. And it, that kind of threw us off at first because we thought that maybe we were seeing crushed nanotubes or folded or graphene that was folded under. So we, but we put a lot of effort into looking at uh, different samples and it fold at, we actually investigated folded nano ribbons to really see what's happening at this edge. And we determined uh, that uh, we, saw, we determined that this edge is not that this edge we see here is actually not folded under. It's not a crushed nanotube, and it's not folded under. We believe very strongly now that what we're seeing is an actually is a terminal edge, as I show in this little cartoon. Uh, but we just happen to have some curvature right here at the edge. Uh, and so, the, and so now that we know that we have these nice terminal edges of our graphene nano ribbons, we can uh, uh, look at them with higher energy, higher resolution at low temperature, and 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 uh, and investigate their atomic structure and their electronic structure simultaneously. And that's what we did. So here, I show a high resolution STM image taken at low temperature of the edge of of a, of a nano ribbon that has a width of of 20 nanometers, and I'm just I'm just zooming in on the edge. So this is the edge, this is gold, and this is the nano ribbon, this greenish stuff, and this orange means that it's taller here. Uh, and, and this is the edge. So first I want you to see that we have a nice, straight, well-ordered edge. And because we, have, uh, we can get atomic resolution for, for, the, for this region near the edge, that allows us to determine the chirality of the edge. So now we can actually directly determine the chirality of the edge by simply looking at this angle with respect to that angle. And that allows us to determine that this nano ribbon, for example, has an 8-1 edge, which means that it goes uh, zig, 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 eight times, and then zag. Zig, 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 zag. And, and on, uh, on and on. Uh, and that's about a 20 angstrom periodicity. Uh, and so, uh, and and so, what we so now that we know the chirality, we can measure the local electronic structure, and we do that using STM spectroscopy, as I described before the technique, uh, and we perform STM spectroscopy at the edge and then uh, at points as we move inward toward the center of the nano ribbon as we move in from the edge. And here I show the data. This is a plot of DIDV versus voltage. The first point. Uh, I can't barely see it, but there's a black dot there on the gold. That refers to this top curve. So on the gold, you see there's, the spectrum is featureless. But here, as we go in to the edge, what we, I want you to focus here on this low energy regime, which I refer to as the elastic regime. And what we see are these peaks suddenly sprouting up uh, here at low energy. And those peaks, uh, are, 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 uh, those, those peaks fall exponentially in amplitude as we move away from the edge. And you can see that here, I've plotted the amplitude of the peaks. And uh, because those peaks fall exponentially, that <coughs> indicates that they are due to an edge state. Because that's one of the characteristics of an edge state, is that its amplitude <coughs> falls exponentially away from the edge. That's what an edge state is. Um, and so here, uh, so here, we're seeing an edge state on these nano ribbons. Uh, but also significantly, is, is, is another significant fact is, is that we see two little peaks. Sometimes they're asymmetrical, but we see these two little peaks. Here you can see a close-up, so you can see these two peaks. 
And we believe that this indicates that there's an energy gap in the edge state, the, where the energy gap is the energy difference between those two peaks. Uh, and so we measured these, uh, this behavior on many different nano ribbons. And we saw that for different widths of nano ribbons, we got a different energy gap. And so here I show that data. We see that the energy gap gets bigger as we decrease the width of the nano ribbon. So we see a one over width dependence on the energy gap of this edge state. So now, uh, oh, also uh, we measured the, uh, how the edge state varies parallel to the edge and, and, and here in this data. And we see that the amplitude of the edge state oscillates. It goes up and down and up and down and up. So there's a periodicity to the amplitude of the edge state, which is, approximate, which is approximately the same periodicity of, of, of this 8-1 edge. So now we have um, the atomic scale structure and the electronic structure of the edge. So now we can start to compare our results to uh, theoretical calculations. And so these calculations were done by Stephen Louis and Oleg Yasiev and their coworkers, and they used a tight binding model to simulate the electronic structure of uh, nano ribbons that have precisely the same uh, symmetry of the same edge structure and the same width as as, as the nano ribbons that we measured. Uh, and here I show the results of their calculations. This is the electronic structure and the density of states that they calculated for this nano ribbon, an 8-1 nano ribbon with a 20 nanometer width. Uh, and, you can, and, and this is a calculation done uh, in the absence of electron-electron interactions. And what you see here is a metallic edge state at zero, which leads to a big peak in the density of states. Now that's not what we saw. And so in order to simulate what we saw, they had to turn on the electron-electron interactions. And they did that using a, a Hubbard model, uh, uh, using a mean field solution of a Hubbard model. Uh, and when they turned on the electron-electron interactions, that caused a gap to open up in that edge state. And that gap that opened up was of an order of magnitude very close to what we saw experimentally. So, so th there's some agreement here between their theory and our, and our data. And I just want to mention to you what the physics is. What's happening as they turn on the electron-electron interaction, that's causing that edge state to become magnetic. So the, to the edge, each of the edges becomes magnetic. They become antiferromagnetically correlated. And that antiferromagnetic correlation causes this gap right there to open up. So that's, that's what happens in the model. So we, we actually saw that same gap in our experiment. But we, in, the, in the model, it arises due to magnetism, but we have not actually seen, we have not measured magnetism in our experiment. We just see the gap. So we, we can also compare, uh, uh, now that we have this nice theory, we can actually compare the, uh, our other results, the spatial dependence of the edge state to, to their theory. So here's the spatial dependence as we move per perpendicular from the edge, parallel to the edge, and the width dependence of the edge state energy gap that we measured experimentally. And here's what they calculated using their tight binding model. Uh, and in red is the theory, and, and so you can see there's pretty good agreement between uh, experiment and theory here. So I feel that this is very strong evidence that we are seeing an edge state for these graphene nano ribbons, and this edge state has an energy gap that is width dependent. So that's where I want to stop, uh, and I'll stop just by concluding that I think carbon still has a few surprises left. I've told you a little bit about what happens when we sprinkle atoms down on graphene. Uh, how we're able to measure pseudo-field effects on graphene, and how uh, we have uh, discovered the presence of an edge state on chiral graphene nanoribbons. I think there's still a lot of things to do in the future, and we'll talk about them in the future. But for now, I just want to tell you who my collaborators were. A lot of people collaborated on this work. Uh, here are the different PIs who collaborated. Uh, I won't read their names, but you can read them yourself right there. But here below, more importantly, are the students and postdocs who collaborated on this work. And for the ad atom spectroscopy, uh, this project was done by Victor Brar, Regis Decker, Yang Wang, Hans Michael Solowan, Chawler Girat, Kevin Chan, Hong Kyung Lee, Will Regan, Will Gannett. The pseudo field, pseudo magnetic field work was done by Niv Levy, Sarah Burke, Casey Meeker, and Melissa Panlasigi, in addition to help from, from these guys. Uh, the graphene nano ribbon work was done by Chen Gang Tao, Yan Xia Chen, Li Ying Zhao, Zhuang Zhuang Feng, Xiao Wei Zheng, Oleg Yaziev, and Rodrigo Capaz. And the funding for this work was uh, funded. This work was funded by the Department of Energy, Office of Naval Research, and the U.S. National Science Foundation. All right, that's it.
Uh, we still have some work to do. Uh, I'm gearing up to do it. Uh, we, I mean, at least we have the sample processing down. That's, that's good. That, that's, you know, uh, the hardest, at some level, the hardest part. We know how to prepare these samples, but now we have to start preparing the tips. And, uh, and, the, and, and part of the problem is that the, the system where I'm doing the ad atom, moving the, doing the atomic manipulation of the atoms, that's the same system that I would use for the spin polars STM. So I'd have to, you know, we want to finish up that project before we do the spin polars. Because, you know, it depends on the anisotropy energy. I do not expect a strong high anisotropy energy for the cobalt. And this is at 4 degrees Kelvin. Yeah, but I don't have a magnetic field. I know, I'm the only guy. I'm like one of the few guys who doesn't have a magnetic field. I have no magnetic field. I have a pseudo magnetic field. I have a pseudo magnetic field. So, so at least I have that. So I should be happy, but I don't have a real. Um, first, I, I want to point out that we do not know what is the actual termination. You know, you know everything that I know because everything I know is right there, right here on this slide. Uh, you know STM too. You know, so we. So this is our edge. So we, we definitely know the chirality of the edge because we, we know this structure. But the actual termination, like is it terminated by a hydrogen atom or a carboxylic acid or an oxygen atom, that we don't know. So we don't know the absolute edge termination. However, despite, no matter, even if it's terminated with different atoms, at some level you still expect these edge states to exist. Because if, if the termination is just bonded to that uh, sigma bond sticking out, as long as the pi network is not all messed up, then we still expect this edge state to occur. So that will lead to bond bending of on the graphene. And uh, in that case, I mean, you notice that it, there is a bump at the edges. This curvature. This curvature. Uh, That's structural. That will be a natural consequence of the electronegativity. It will decay in an oscillatory manner inside the uh, ribbon. Uh, a lot of the observations will be the same with a classical model. And in this respect, I'm just wondering, when you saw the trimer, the cobalt trimer, were there any Friedel oscillations seen? I didn't notice any. Uh, um, any? Yes. I, I didn't show all of the data there, but there are Friedel. We have okay. seen some Friedel oscillations in certain parameter regimes. So they should be also present in the nano ribbons. Uh, and that oh, so you're saying you're saying that you could have a Friedel, like a Friedel oscillation decay? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, but one thing is, is that it, it, I don't see exactly how that would lead to an energy gap, especially a width-dependent energy well, gap. Uh, if you have dipoles at the end, if they're, uh, say, OH groups or something, yeah. and the shorter ones, there would be interaction. In the what? Open, there would be interaction between dipoles, and that will open up a gap. Oh, you mean across the width? Yes. It would be a width-dependent gap. Uh, well, okay, I mean, we'd have to think about, I'd have to think about that. That's an interesting observation. You, you said the two opposite edges, the ferromagnetic, were anti-ferromagnetically aligned, right? That, that's and the prediction. We have not seen see, magnetism. Because, I mean, that, that must, well, in the prediction, that must be due to an RKKY interaction, which is a bit like the three del interaction that he's talking about. But, of course, that, that depends on having a, a Fermi surface. I mean, let's see, you've hardly got a Fermi surface with this almost zero gap, have you? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you're. Are you, uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, I mean, you, you know the RKKY interaction between magnetic impurities in a metal that that, uh, that you get an oscillatory interaction. Can I answer this question? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> in 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 graphene at zero density, uh, there is RKKY interaction which. Uh, decays as one or R cube unexpectedly for two-dimensional system. So the way how you can figure this out is you take uh, the distance between impurities, then the Kakawa interaction will be carried by electrons with typical momentum of the order of inverse of this distance. You take the density of states corresponding to this momentum, which is non-zero, and then plug it into the usual Kakawa formula, which will give you one over R cube. 
What determines the, the wave vector for the oscillation? It's normally given by it, the it depends. It depends where exactly you put the impurity. If uh, the it's spin is on the side... It's normally given by the dimensions of a Fermi surface, right? Yes. In this case, I, I don't know. Yes, yeah, so in this case there is no Fermi surface, yes. but in this case there is a typical range of momenta which contributes to the polarization, which is of the order of the inverse distance between magnetic atoms. And the, uh, the details depend on where exactly on the lattice you put the magnetic atom. Yeah, if you put it on the side, uh, then it will oscillate between A and B sublattices. I still don't see where the oscillation comes from without the Fermi surface. The oscillation comes from uh, that you have two sublattices, and that you have uh, the uh, corners of the brilliant zone, which is finite momentum. Yeah, I just uh, uh, wonder about the, the pseudo uh, fields, and if it can really uh, generate so high uh, magnetic fields, like several, several hundred Tesla, do you think like, it will influence your measurements because of the electrical you know, facilities? The, the thing is, though, that it's, um, it's not an actual magnetic field, it's, a, it's an orbital effect. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just how the electrons are moving. They're moving as though they feel that field, but there's no real magnetic field there. For example, there's no Zeeman effect. You know, the spins are not feeling it. It's purely an orbital effect. So, so it's not, so I don't think that, you know, so I don't think that there's a magnetic field then that's really gonna affect us. It's, it's uh, just affecting the electrons moving in the graphene. It, it, does that? So also related to that pseudo field, do you expect a, uh, a quantum hole effect as a result of it? Uh, if you say it's an orbital effect, then quantum hole effect is an orbital effect. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but in these, uh, <laughs> but we're just looking at the, these very small regions, you know, so just these. be a way of measuring a quantum hole effect in, in zero field. Uh, yeah, I, I, you're saying if you could perform transport measurement on it and on, on just those strained regions, yeah, I think in principle you, you should be able to do that. You should expect an effect on transport from this the magnetic field. But I measure no effect on transport uh, for reasonable wrinkles of a few nanometers. Um, it, it doesn't show up. Um, is there any critical angle of the curvature? A typical scale to get a field of one Tesla would require a strain of, uh, say, 1% over one micron distance. So if the fields are so large because Michael's uh, bubbles are so small and strain within those bubbles, I believe 10% or something like that. So, okay, and you know, when you have one Tesla field, it's, uh, it's, it's probably in typical samples on silicon oxide, they're just covered uh, by impurity effect. It can also depend on the symmetry of the strain field, because this is, I think we kind of got lucky here, it really has this trigonal symmetry, yes. because it's the 111 FCC. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If, exactly. if you just have a uh, homogeneous strain, it would would be plus minus field, and it's cancel each other. That's it. So Additional scattering rather than anything else. So we got kind of lucky here. Your nano ribbons are lying on gold, and gold presumably should dope it. So can you? And you, you, you think that they're just hanging in the air? Okay, so, so to what you're asking, to what degree, what is the effect I'm of the doping? To why, why don't you, uh, what you expect from, go, uh, from okay. doping by gold and so on? Okay, uh, so yeah, I mean, take a look, you know, we do see doping, I mean, like right here, look, see how this thing is, is offset from zero. Um, uh, let me make two comments on that. First, I, I want to point out that people have grown graphene on gold 111. And they see that the gold 111 does not interfere too much with the electronic structure of the graphene. It still has the Dirac cone, and there's not a lot of charge transfer for that perfect system. Uh, however, here we have an imperfect system because we have these nano ribbons, and there, it is not a perfectly clean system. There is, there is also adsorbates down there. It, it was transported through air. <clears throat> and so what we see are, are, are uh, fluctuations on the order of plus or minus 20 millivolts.
from rib ribbon to ribbon variations. And these variations are almost precisely what people have seen in the past for nanotubes on gold 111. When people have performed spectroscopy of nano ribbons on gold 111, they also saw shifts uh, in their electronic structure of this same order. So I, so it's, I cannot really tell you what is causing the, there, so, we do, so we do see some charge transfer on the same order as the nanotube guys, but I cannot distinguish whether this charge transfer is from the gold or from adsorbates. We have measured the transfer length of graphene on gold and it is of the order of three microns, which is huge. That is the efficiency of transfer, charge transfer, is very, very weak. Jack Blakely from Cornell. Um, my question was, uh, are you sure there, there are bubbles, or is the substrate restructured underneath? The, the reason I ask the question is, um, in, in the 70s, um, in my group, we, we did a lot of work on forming graphene. Graphene forms as a stable monolayer phase uh, on nickel 111, where the, the epitaxial fit is excellent. But if you go off that orientation, then it's, you still get the same phase transformation, but it's accompanied by um, formation of, of pyramids on the substrate. In other words, the, the whole substrate restructures with, uh, to form to expose 111 facets on which the graphene then grows. And um, so my question was, uh, are, are they bubbles, or are they just uh, pyramids of the substrate covered with graphene? Well, I mean, um, we tried tearing them apart, you know, to see what was underneath them, but it got kind of messy, you know, so <laughs> that was, you know, that would be the uh, obvious thing to do. Uh, so uh, we weren't able to, we were not able to peel it back. Uh, w I think that there is not a pyramid underneath. Uh, one reason I, I, I think that is because one of the things that we've noticed is that when the graphene is touching a metal, you know, actually in full body contact, like on the platinum or on the gold, then the, uh, the, the, the features, this, this electron phonon feature, the Dirac, uh, the, the Dirac feature, the Dirac point feature, they, they go away. They get swallowed up by that electronic wave function. And, and, and we're not, and, and on these nanobubbles, uh, we're seeing as soon as as soon as we get to the edge of the nano bubble, all of these features come back. You know, we start seeing the features that we expect for the sort of the suspended graphene. Uh, whereas I would expect to start seeing, you know, the metallic, you know, the the, the signs of the metal underneath, and, and we don't see that. I, I uh, so so that's sort of like a little kind of experimental answer. Uh, but other than that, I don't really know what the energy of formation is for these pyramid. You know, that that I don't know. Sure. I, I suppose the test would be to, to actually uh, look at a substrate that was restructured and see whether you still see the same STM uh, features. And to see, but you're saying would the, the, then the graphing would have to provide enough strain to, to cause the uh, platinum to, uh, to do that? Well, if, if, if you go off, if, if, if you do these, if you form the graphene at high temperatures, uh, where the, there is enough mobility, atomic mobility, uh, of the substrate, uh, they do restructure into pyramidal. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, but features. but but remember, people have been looking at this at room temperature for for many years, and so they so going from high temperature to room temperature, yes. it's not seen. So it's really something that was that we saw as we went from room temperature to low temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. I mean, the effect of your pseudo-magnetic field will be washed out at, at a certain temperature, right, proportional to the field, just like the Haas van Alphen is washed out. I mean, have you observed such temperature dependence? Well, it's, it's too big. Uh, the energy spacing is hundreds of millivolts. So I think that we would need temperatures on the order, you know, uh, KT on the order of hundreds of millivolts to wash it out. So really? I, 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 I see. Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, a normal normal fields you can put on the house for now for now are washed out at you know about 1k or something yeah but these i mean but we have these but we have these separations now of a big big you know 100 how millivolt much? separations how much 100 millivolt or, or a few hundreds of millivolts so okay. that would be you know <laughs> okay. gigantic enormous temperature so okay but you should maybe at least see the beginning of some 
you know, whatever is shown. If, as we start moving from 4K to room temperature? Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Have you seen anything that close to the armchair edges? We, we see a random distribution of chiralities. Uh, we would very much like to see the armchair because then there should not be an edge state. And so that would be a very important uh, observation. Uh, we have, I, I can't remember the closest that we got to it, but we, we haven't, we haven't gotten the armchair. The armchairs are very rare. You know, they're the most rare because it requires a zigzag nanotube, you know, and those are the most rare ones, a perfect zigzag nanotube because we believe they, they cut axially. So I think it makes sense that there's not a lot of them down on the surface, but uh, we would like to observe that. One way, actually, that I want to try to do it is, you know, this guy, Klaus Mullen, who's doing his uh, molecular precursor growth, he only grows armchair. So this molecular precursor grows only armchair nanoribbons. So we're actually trying to do that to get the armchair. Re related to that, I think if you go to the really kind of smaller width, at some point that uh, the bulk start kind of opens up the gap. And then you the should, what? Uh, when you get into smaller width, eventually bulk gap is big enough so that you can pick up that the gap features from your spectroscopy inside of the nano ribbon, not only the edges, right? I, don't, I wonder whether you can pick up those kind of bulk gap. Something like that, if I just look at the curve, say 80 nanometers, or 80 angstroms of the width, probably bulk gap becomes appreciable so that you should be able to detect that using the STM spectroscopy. I see. Um, yeah, I mean, that's something, for us, that, that's something for us to look for. But I'll, I'll tell you a problem that we have. One of the problems that we have is that uh, as we go into the middle of the nano ribbon, it's in close contact with the gold. And so then we, we don't see the graphene features when we do spectroscopy when the, when the nanoribbon is, is directly in contact with the gold. So as we go into the bulk, then uh, uh, it, it, it's washed out. So we need to take the nanoribbons and put them on a different, kind of, um, a different kind of surface. Luckily, this curvature takes the nanoribbon off of the gold. And so we're able to see the exponential decay uh, before before the, before the graphene reaches the gold. So I believe that the exponential decay is an intrinsic effect and not due to the gold. But as we go further in, we, we cannot do the measurement on gold. Annette Plout from Exeter University. I just wondered how reversible your nanobubbles were. So if you heated it up, do they dis... I mean, clearly they disappear. Do they come back again if you recool down um, in the same place? Well, the, the, the problem is that once we, for this particular system, we do not have the capability to warm up and cool down and find the same microscopic location. So I'm pretty sure that we've taken, I'm 90% I'm sure that we've taken the same sample and warmed it up and cooled it down. Uh, I'm, yeah, it's actually 95% 90, sure uh, that we've taken the same sample and warmed it up and cooled it down in the ultra high vacuum chamber to room temperature and cold it, cool it down and then look at other regions of the surface. We did not do a careful study at room temperature, so I, I, I expect that they disappear uh, based on the measurements that other people have done, but we did not do a careful study at room temperature. We did all, all of our measurements at low temperature. So uh, I expect that they disappear because then the differential thermal uh, expansion uh, is not so strong, uh, but, but, but I don't know. We didn't, we, I'm pretty sure we did not do that measurement. I'll have to ask my students again if they did the room temperature, but I, I'm not, I don't think we did. Mike, thanks uh, very much for your fascinating talk and for being so patient with all the questions. Um, let's thank the speaker again. A question is, why do we want to manipulate graphene at the atomic scale? Why do we care? Graphene is a multipotent uh, uh, material. It has a lot of different opportunities. So in the future, you can uh, imagine graphene being produced roughly the same way as a newsprint is produced today, uh, with uh, very large machines that produce 7 meter wide uh, material at 200 kilometers an hour. And uh, it will certainly have uh, major impact, impacts. Uh, think, for instance, about uh, lightweight composite materials, because graphene is uh, 
one to three hundred times stronger than the uh, strongest steel. Uh, so uh, in uh, airplanes, in cars, uh, you can reduce the weight, you can improve uh, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, new kinds of uh, uh, medical uh, implants, uh, there are uh, uh, plans for, uh, for instance, retina implants. Uh, there are techniques now that uh, are being developed to use uh, graphene membranes uh, to desalinate uh, uh, seawater uh, to make it portable. So it, uh, it's a technology that has very wide application area. So it will certainly penetrate the life of Europeans on many levels. And because of these great opportunities, we see that there is also great potential for new products, uh, new investment opportunities, new uh, job opportunities and increased economic growth in, in Europe. And the idea is that what we would like to eventually do, I think what a lot of people in this room would like to do, and some of us are already starting to do it, is to carve graphene up, to cut it up into little quantum mechanical, little structures that are designed at the quantum mechanical level to perform certain functions. And we would like to be able to functionalize the graphene with atoms and molecules and control the edges and then wire it up with metals so that we could create an integrated device on a single layer of graphene so that we could have a better video game for our children. And so this is, this is something that a lot of people are working towards. And uh, Fade Navoris, I think, showed some nice progress in this direction. But there's still a lot of work that we need to do in order to achieve this, this kind of a, of, of a dream. Uh, and uh, part of that work involves uh, better understanding how graphene behaves at microscopic length scales, at the atomic length scale. In other words, what happens uh, around individual atoms, what happens at edges, and what happens when you strain graphene at very small length scales. We can see great applications in uh, flexible electronics. Uh, electronic paper is uh, one of the first things coming out. New kinds of composite materials, ubiquitous electronics. You can uh, have electronics in your uh, clothing, for instance, or integrated in wallpaper. My own group, we're very interested in using STM to perform local spectroscopy on graphene. And so a few years ago, we set out to perform uh, STM spectroscopy on gated graphene devices, such as the one that you see here. This is a photograph of a little device we made with Alex Zettel's help. Uh, this is a graphene flake, and we can gate it from the back and perform uh, STM spectroscopy. And what we expected to see when we did this experiment a few years ago is we expected to see uh, uh, a V in, in the local density of states, in, in the DIDV, because the local density of states of a material often mimics the total density of states, which is linear for graphene. And so and there's the Dirac point. And so that's what we expected to see. But when we did the experiment, that's not what we saw. <clears throat> in fact, we saw something that looked kind of different. Uh, here I show you the data, uh, what we actually saw. This is a plot of DIDV versus bias voltage between the tip and the surface. Uh, this is uh, the Fermi level. And, and here we have filled states and empty states. And each of these curves is measured at a different gate voltage. And we're becoming more and more p-doped as we go up each additional curve. And so the density of states is sort of shifting to the right uh, as you go up those curves due to the gating. Uh, and, and, and here we saw, some, we saw two features. One was this gap-like feature that's pinned to the Fermi level. Uh, and the other is this asymmetric dip off to one side. Now, this, this gap-like feature uh, is pinned to the Fermi level for different gate voltages. So, so, we, so that tells us that it's not a, a, a band structure feature of graphene. It's some kind of excitation. And what we believe is happening is that this is a sign of, uh, it's not a true gap, but it's a sign of inelastic tunneling, phonon-assisted inelastic tunneling. And the idea is that when we, when, we get a, when we come to a bias here at about 65 volts, then the electrons have enough, the tunneling electrons have enough energy to create a phonon, uh, an out-of-plane phonon in the graphene. And so that creation of that phonon helps to get the electrons in. So we get a big jump in the current due to this inelastic tunneling channel. Here, this little dip, uh, that feature moves with gate voltage, so that tells us that it's a band structure feature, and in fact, that, that is actually uh, due to the Dirac point. So you can see the Dirac point moving, as you would expect, as you p-dope the material. So this is, so I just wanted to show you this and drag you through this, because this is sort of the, the baseline STM uh, uh, spectroscopy of graphene. And this is what we see after doing some elaborate uh, tip calibration procedures. 
But what we're really interested in is uh, what happens when you modify graphene and what are the local properties of the graphene when you change it, when you manipulate its properties. Graphene oxide uh, was shown by uh, Rahul in the physics department here to have high permeability to water but to be an effective barrier to all kinds of other things. One of the ideas is to use graphene as a type of nanomembrane or filter and that harnesses the fact that graphene is very impermeable. It's, uh, even very light gases don't pass through. And that means that if we were able to tailor the size of the pores within the graphene lattice, it might be possible to produce a very selective filter or perhaps use smaller graphene sheets and use the pathways in between the sheets in order to tailor the porosity or the permeability of the membrane. 40 years ago or so, desalination used to be based mainly on thermal methods whereby you would use high temperatures to separate um, clean water from the, the seawater uh, and, and extract it that way. That was high energy, it was high cost, and some plants in the Gulf still use that method, I believe, but it's not currently what's used now. So now there's been a growing trend towards, over the last 40 years, a growing trend towards use of reverse osmosis and membrane technology in provision of desalinated water, whereby you move the seawater across a semi-permeable membrane and you have the uh, desalinated water on the other side of the membrane. And this can be a world of difference to what happens on a small scale in the lab and what happens when you have football fields worth of membrane area on a real plant. So there are many challenges to actually getting a new membrane material accepted and used commercially on an industrial scale. And so those are the kinds of questions that I'm going to talk about today in this talk. Uh, so, um, so here they are, impurity, strain, and cutting graphene into little nano ribbon shapes. That's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, but before I get to that, I'll, I'll, I'll say some introductory words uh, talking about um, the techniques that we're, we've been using to do this work. Uh, which is mainly scanning tunneling microscopy. So I'll give you, I'll say a few introductory words about that technique. Uh, and then I'll, I'll say a little bit of also introductory words about the technique of STM spectroscopy, which uh, is a technique that we have found to be very useful for exploring these kinds of issues in, in graphene. Uh, so, uh, so first, let's just start with uh, discussing uh, scanning tunneling microscopy as, as a technique for exploring small structures. Uh, uh, a scanning tunneling microscope is a sharp metal needle which uh, we bring very close to a surface. We put a voltage between the needle and the surface and we measure the tunnel current and the rate at which these electrons tunnel from the tip to the surface is proportional to the lo electronic local density of states of, of the structure beneath the tip. Right, v Faden? <laughs> and uh, you remember giving these talks? <laughs> And, um, and this is a very useful quantity to measure because the electronic local density of states gives you a measure of the probability of finding an electron at a, a certain point in space at a certain point in energy. So if you can map that quantity out, you can learn a lot about what the electrons are doing in small structures. Uh, also, by varying this uh, voltage and measuring the differential conductivity of this STM tunnel junction, you can measure what we uh, refer to as DIDV. And by measuring that as a function of uh, the voltage between the tip and the sample, we can measure the energy dependence of the local density of states beneath the STM tip. And that's what this little cartoon is meant to show. And here, V equals zero is the Fermi level. And these are filled states. And these are empty states. Also, uh, the STM allows us to measure inelastic excitations of small structures. And the way we do that is if we put a bias on the STM tip that's big enough so that electrons tunneling from the tip to the surface have enough energy to create an inelastic excitation, then that gives those electrons an additional channel to go from the tip to the surface, an inelastic channel, uh, uh, say by making a phonon, for example, and that then gives us a jump. See this little step right here? That gives us a jump in the DIDV at the, uh, at the uh, threshold energy for creating those excitations. So this technique has been used a lot over the years <clears throat> to study uh, graphene uh, in, in different forms. In fact, people were using STM to study graphene back in 19, 
92, <laughs> although they didn't call it graphene back then, and it was not isolated uh, the way Gaim and Novoselov have since isolated it. Uh, this is graph people used to study graphene on metal surfaces a long time ago. Uh, more recently, people have been studying graphene with STM on other substrates, such as silicon carbide, silicon oxide, and more recently, uh, boron nitride, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. This is data from the Georgia Tech group, the Columbia group, and this is some data from my own group. And there's a lot of groups around the world that have been using STM to look at graphene, and here I've just listed some of the people uh, who are doing nice work with STM, but there are others too. I'm sorry if your name is not on there. Um, so, uh, in, or in uh, many other ways. Theory had shown that graphene wasn't possible to exist in nature, it wasn't stable. Then many people didn't think to look for it as a true two dimensional material. And uh, Andre Geim and Kostya decided that this was not necessarily true, and so they went looking for it. And the way that they went looking for it was using, as you've probably heard of, the Scotch tape method, which involves sellotape and a piece of, not pencil, but of high purity graphite. How do we go from this layered material to getting a single layer? A layer that's only one atom thick, um, a layer of graphene. It's actually surprisingly simple. You need to use a simple piece of sticky tape, and we use, this, we use the tape to pull the layers of graphite apart. And every time we pull the tape apart, we break our graphite up. We're cleaving it, pulling apart the layers. So the pieces of graphite we had in here originally would have contained many thousands of layers. And if we do this enough times, we can hopefully end up with some layers that are only one or two atoms thick. One of the things that really helped us to understand that you really did have graphene was the types of very exciting new microscopes that are now available and it was the availability of these microscopes that really helped them understand that what they actually had was a single atomic layer. Once you've worked with graphene for a while you get very used to looking at it and it's very easy for me to say that that is monolayer graphene while this here is probably two layers and these bits here are really quite thick. My name is Rahul Arnair. My name area of research is graphene-based membrane. So graphene oxide is super permeable to water, which means there is no resistance or barrier for water molecule to evaporate through graphene oxide. So this is how we produce our uh, graphene oxide membrane for our laboratory experiments. So we use this kind of porous support material to deposit uh, graphene oxide sheet to make a uh, freestanding membrane. So you use porous support there, then you pour graphene oxide solution over here. So this is a graphene oxide solution in water, it has single layer graphene oxide dispersed uh, in pure water. Then you use this water on top of this porous alumina membrane. Then you, uh, you start pumping using a vacuum pump, then you remove all liquid water through this al alumina membrane and your graphene oxide sheet get deposited on top of this alumina. And finally after drying you can peel it off this freestanding graphene oxide and uh, you can study membrane property or you can also characterize this membrane in some different techniques.